All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to our tech webinar on why less is more tips for effective educational materials. I'm Claudia Medina, the educational materials coordinator. Hope everyone's doing well and I'm so happy to have everyone uh, join me today and this morning. Um, we wanted to have this webinar on tips for creating effective educational materials because since we've all been home, um, tech has seen an increase of projects reaching out to us for technical assistance on their materials. You know, it's, it's one of those scope of work activities that you can do at home. So we have definitely seen an increase um, on projects working on their material. Um, so I hope that you will apply some of these tips you learned today to your material. Um, some quick housekeeping, all mics will be muted. And throughout the webinar, there will be a few polls um, trying to make it a little bit more interactive. And then um, also this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with everybody who's registered afterwards. And so with that being said, um, I want to get a sense of who's on the on the webinar, who's registered. So I'm going to launch a poll. And yeah, just go ahead and type your answers. What projects are on the webinar? I'm just curious to see who's all on. I'm going to give it another seconds to have everybody vote if you haven't. All right, I'm going to end the poll. So if you haven't put it in, go ahead and do so now. I'm going to share the results with you all. So it looks like uh, we have pretty close with the LLAs and competitive grantees. We have some regional projects on joining and statewide and CTCP folks. Well, welcome and thanks for stopping by. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. So before I get started on my actual uh, webinar, I wanted to give a quick update um, or overview of how tech can support your educational material needs in case there are any new folks on or projects that haven't reached out to us. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our online catalog. Here you will find hundreds of free downloadable tobacco educational materials, such as brochures, fat cards, posters, and signs. And then some of our new material also has a room for you to add your logo and contact information. There's like a little white box. Um, so if you do see a material that you like, you can contact us and we can add your logo and contact information. So whenever you get a chance, go ahead out and check out our catalog. Um, now, if you don't find what you need in our catalog and um, tech can provide technical assistance for educational material development, to CTCP funded projects. Uh, our TA services include uh, graphic design, editing, uh, readability tests. Uh, we can give you review and feedback on a material that you have created. And then we can also translate your materials too. So meet the Tech TA team. Um, there, tech has many people working behind the scenes, but this is the main team of people who provide technical assistance. Um, we have Sinra, Laura, Wendy, and I. We help with the editing and content development. And then we have Jennifer, Lauren, and Kimberly, and they make up our great graphic design team. Uh, we are very lucky to have them. They do such a great job on our material. So that's our team. Um, and here's our agenda. So these are some of the things that I will be going over today. Uh, I will be talking about identifying your audience and the purpose of your material and how to keep your material simple and brief, choosing the best format for your material. Um, and then I will quickly go over some consumer testing info and then I'll also share some additional resources um, along with the Q&A portion at the end. So um, if you have any questions as I'm going through the slides, feel free to add it in the chat box and then I will answer them during the Q&A portion. Uh, Wendy will also be monitoring the chat box as I'm speaking and she may also join me at the end to answer some questions. So uh, go ahead and, and, and put your questions in whenever you have one. 
All right. So here's my next poll. So if you were at a community event and uh, there was a table you approached and they had these two materials you're seeing on your screen, which one of these materials would you go and pick up? Which one would you actually want to read? So would you pick up material A on your left hand side or would you pick up material B? I'm going to give it another few seconds for those that still need to put in their vote. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Well, it looks like 91% of you went to material A, which is awesome. And there's a few that went to material B, which is also okay. But I was really hoping that a lot of you would pick material A. So that's great news. Um, because we know that uh, people's attention span is very short. So you want to make sure your material does not look overwhelming and has tons of information like material B does. Um, you want something more digestible like material A that has less information and is easy on the eye. So um, these two materials we did not create, but I just found these on the online and I thought they were a great comparison. Um, so here's a list of some of the common mistakes that people make when developing their materials um, that we see. So by far, the biggest problem we see is that people want to provide way too much information. Um, less is more. The other issues uh, that we see is not having a clear audience or people are trying to make one material for multiple audiences. Um, and then also not having a clear purpose for your material. And then we also see that uh, the information provided doesn't have a logical flow and there's too much jargon or technical language. But don't worry guys, that's why tech is here to help you and make sure you don't continue to make these mistakes. So when creating your material, you first wanna start with identifying your audience and the specific purpose of your material. Try to avoid creating a material just to inform your audience. So you don't want to create a material just to inform your audience about the dangers of secondhand smoke. So your audience, always remember who will be reading your material. Whenever possible, choose one clearly defined audience. Uh, your resource will be less effective if it tries to serve too many purposes. Uh, don't try to create a material that can be used for, let's say, community members and city officials. The information you provide to city officials may not be relevant to community members um, and vice versa. So you want to make sure you pick, uh, pick one audience. You also want to move your audience into action. So most of you are creating a materials to motivate your audience into some kind of call to action. You want to be explicit about what you want them to do with the information you've given them. Uh, it should be rare that your materials are strictly just to inform people about a topic. So think about why you want them to have this information and use that as an insight to create your call to action. So some examples of a call to action can be to advocate for policy changes. Uh, you could put join to join your community to make a change or join your coalition to make a change in your community. Um, you can also put for free help to quit or smoking call the smokers helpline. Um, and then you can also refer people to a resource uh, if you want them to have more in depth information. So you can put something like visit flavorshookkids.org. So these are some good examples of call to actions that you want to make sure you're including in your educational material. So keep it simple and brief. The more you write, the less people will read. So health literacy. Health literacy is a degree to which an individual has the capacity um, to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information 
and service, services to make the appropriate health decisions. Uh, so the CDC mentions that nine out of 10 adults struggle to understand and use health information when it's unfamiliar, complex, um, or jargon-filled. So we can improve health literacy if we practice clear communication strategies um, and techniques. So what is clear communication? Well, um, that means using familiar concepts, words, numbers, and images presented in a way that makes sense to people who need that information. So present it in a way that your audience will understand. So keep your messages focused. When working uh, on your material, start with the most important information first, and then you want to end with your call to action. There should be a logical flow to the information, such as uh, you want to start by stating the problem. For example, when there are uh, more tobacco stores near schools, the youth, the youth tobacco usage increases. And then you want to go into offering a solution. So a solution can be zoning laws can limit how close to schools uh, tobacco can be sold. And then lastly, you'll have your call to action, which is talk to your city council about changing zoning laws in your city. So that's kind of how you want the flow of your material to be when you're creating it. And then here are some other things to keep in mind. Uh, you want to limit your messages to no more than three to four critical need to know main points uh, that will drive your audience uh, into action. Um, think of this as an elevator pitch and skip the details that are only nice to know. You want to use short, memorable sentences. Uh, and then you also want to use uh, one to two syllable words. Again, and shorter sentences will also uh, keep the reading level lower. So um, you want to have like less than 20 words per sentence, something around there. And then you also don't want to repeat the same type of information. Uh, so what I mean by that is you don't need to give three different statistics about the dangers of secondhand smoke. So when using data and statistics, uh, use statistics to support your, uh, your talking points, but you don't want to overdo it. So again, one compelling data point is much more memorable than listing a whole bunch of statistics. Um, in fact, sometimes providing too much data can backfire and cause people to doubt what you're saying. You also want to round your numbers whenever possible. So for example, you can say smoke can travel more than 20 feet instead of saying smoke can travel 23 feet. You can also uh, replace your statistics with words such as many, um, most, and half. So for example, uh, many people have used this fact in their material of 80% of youth who have tried tobacco started with the flavored product. Well, you can instead say, eight out of 10 youth, um, or you can also say most youth who have tried tobacco started with the flavor product. If you must um, include statistics, try putting them in parentheses as you can see in the example. So choose your words carefully. Communicate as if you were talking to a friend. Um, a conversational style has more natural tone and is easy to understand. Uh, so for example, say you could get sick from breathing secondhand smoke rather than uh, secondhand smoke exposure could cause adverse health effects. You also want to highlight the positive. Tell your audience uh, what they should do rather than what they should not do. So you want to say something like keep your home healthy and smoke free rather than saying, don't allow smoking in your home. And then make your materials easy to understand um, by avoiding jargon, a technical slash scientific language, and medical terminology whenever possible. Uh, we want to use the plain language when creating materials. So on your screen, you can see some examples of words that we use and the plain language version. So rather than saying respiratory illness, we can say something like lung disease. 
uh, rather than saying carcinogenic, we can say uh, can cause cancer. And then finally, rather than saying tobacco control, we could say something like protect our community from the harms of tobacco. So write text that's easy to read. It's better to use an active voice because it's easier for people to understand. For example, the child ate, uh, the, child ate the cigarette butt is using an active voice. The cigarette butt was eaten by a child is the same sentence, but just using a passive voice. So for the general public, text should be written at an eighth grade level or lower. Um, and then I know some people may worry about uh, eighth grade level text may offend high, highly skilled readers, but however, most people are often pressed for time and will appreciate that quick, concise information uh, written in everyday language. Um, if you're creating a material in a different language, let's just say you're uh, having it in Spanish, creating it in Spanish, you might want to consider using an even lower reading level, something like around fifth grade, just to make sure that um, regardless of their educational background, everyone can understand uh, what you're saying. Um, and then you can also, which is a really neat resource, you can check your Flesh Kincaid uh, grade level um, of your material in Microsoft Word. Um, I didn't know about this until I started working at Tech, so it's a pretty cool resource. So I'm gonna show you on the next slide here uh, a little video of how to check your reading level in Word. So you're gonna go to your Files tab, and you're gonna scroll down to your Options, and then you're gonna go to the Proofing tab and scroll all the way down till you see a little box where it says show readability statistics. You're gonna check that. And then you're gonna go to your review and you're gonna go to your ABC spell check. And then you're gonna get this little box here. Um, I paused the video so you can see the box. Um, it's a little box that pops up and it gives you your flush concaved grade level here. And you can see this one is written at a ninth grade. Um, but you obviously, like I mentioned, you want it to be less, um, so it can, should be at eighth grade or lower. So it's a cool little resource to check um, to see where your material is at, what grade level it is. And then below, you can also see it gives you the percentage of your passive sentences you are using. So again, if you're not really sure um, about if you're using passive sentence uh, or an active, you can check here too, and it'll give you your percentage. Um, so it's a pretty neat little resource. I know that depending on what version of Word you're using, you may have a different button than the, than the ABC spell check to, to see the reading level. Um, you might have a button that says check document in the left-hand corner in the same spot, um, but you can also always Google how to uh, show the reading level on um, for whatever version of Word you're working with. So. Um, but yeah, go ahead and check that out whenever you're starting your material. I think it's a neat little resource. Oops, let me go back. Okay, so visual and design. Uh, visuals, layout, and design can improve the readability of your materials when used correctly. Um, you can use infographics to visualize the data. Uh, don't try to tackle graphic design on your own, guys. Uh, you wouldn't ask a firefighter to do your taxes now, would you? So come to tech, utilize our tech team of awesome graphic design experts to make sure your materials follow best practices in design principles and accessibility. So now that you have all the information you want to include in your materials, you want to think about what format it fits best. Um, what's the best format for your material? So think about, uh, you wanna think about your audience. Think about the demographic, the literacy level, and then you also wanna think about the context. So how and where will you be reaching your audience? Will you be handing out your material in a community event, uh, at a coalition meeting, or will this be at a city council meeting? And then, you also wanna think about the word count. So certain formats have a limitation on the amount of words uh, you can fit. And then lastly, think about printing. 
uh, you will be print, will you be printing in the office or are you going to have it professionally printed because that also does matter. So on your screen, you should be seeing some different formats that tech uh, creates. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll. So give me one second. So which one of these formats do you mostly use when you're creating your educational material? Um, you may use several of these, but which one of these are you using mostly? Are you mostly creating a postcard, a fact card, a rack card, <clears throat> a wallet card, a brochure, a fact sheet, or a bookmark? And you can see the images if you need um, a better picture. I'm going to give it another few minutes, a few seconds to get people to put in their vote. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end and I'm going to share the results here with you. So hopefully you can see this on your screen. It seems about 73% of you uh, are mainly using fact sheets. And then it seems like brochure and fact cards are a tie with 24%. And then we have postcards um, coming in. And then the least amount is a wallet card and a bookmark. So that's very interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about the which format would be best for what audiences so you can use that moving forward so um set up so as you can see in the images each format has limitation to the amount of words it can fit um so i want to talk about what formats we would suggest that would be best for your audience so if you wanted to create um, a material for youth i would suggest with going something smaller such as a postcard, a rack card, a bookmark, or even a wallet size card. Since we know youth um, will probably not be interested in reading something lengthy like a brochure. And then if you were wanted to do something for community members, I would also suggest those smaller size formats as well. But if you want to create a material that you want to give to a city of, uh, official, a fact sheet can be a great option because you can have more information and you can include all your data. So here's an example of a fact sheet tech created um, for a project whose audience was city officials. Um, as you can see, it's, it's text heavy. It has some graphs and the word count is about 417. So uh, every format has its pros and cons. So for fact sheets, uh, the pros are that they can be uh, easily printed in an office printer. And again, you can fit a decent amount of information on there. Uh, the cons to the fact sheets are they aren't as easy to grab and go for people. If, for example, if you're passing out at community events, um, it might be a little bulky for them. And then they also may be, uh, like I mentioned earlier, less appealing to certain audiences like youth. And then if it has too much information, people may not read the whole thing. They may not get through the whole thing. They may just read the first few sentences and that's it. Here's a, a, another fact sheet we've created, but this one's audience is community members. So as you can see, it's not as text heavy as the one for city officials. Um, it only has uh, around 104 words. Um, and also, it doesn't have a whole lot of data. Um, there's not a lot of, um, gra there's no graphs on this or anything, but there are some large images. Uh, so people uh, most likely will get through this whole thing and read, and read it all because there's not a whole lot of um, text on there. So there's also uh, fact cards that we've created so with fact cards, um, as I mentioned earlier, they're appealing to many audiences, 
and are perfect for passing out at your community events. The downside to a fact card is um, there may be, uh, there's limited space for text and these mainly look best if they're professionally printed. So if you aren't thinking of not getting your materials professionally printed, then I wouldn't say do a fact card. And there's rack cards as well. So these have similar pros and cons to your fact cards. Um, they are easy to grab and go, but they can be, um, they can only be professionally printed and you are limited to the amount of information you can include. Um, but these are also, I think, a neat little format. It's not an everyday thing you see. So I think this one would catch uh, the attention of a lot of your audiences. And then we have our brochures. I know a lot of people um, voted that they used brochures. Um, so brochures are a little bit dated, but like, uh, like you guys voted, a lot of you still use them. Uh, they're great for offering a lot of information, um, but however, in many cases, uh, people may not read all that information. They may not get through all the sides and read it. Um, another downside with uh, brochures, these trifolds, is they're very difficult to print in office and uh, for you to fold it yourself and make sure that the panels align correctly on the front and back if you're printing in the office. Um, but this is an example of one that we've created for another project as well. A lot of uh, projects um, really like to create a brochure for their coalitions, so we see this all the time. And then there's also the half-fold brochures. Again, these are a nice option for a lot of information. Um, and these are easier for you to print and fold yourself in the office. Um, but again, the downside is if you have a lot of information, um, people may not be reading the whole thing. I want to quickly talk about professional printing. Um, there's uh, many benefits to getting your materials professionally printed. Uh, your materials uh, will look more professional and have a higher quality. If you have like a really colorful design in your material, um, getting it professionally printed obviously will get it printed um, fully to the edges, as opposed to if you have a really colorful design and you print it in an office, you most likely will get a white border around your material because your printer can't print all the way to the edge color. Um, and then you can also get a good quality thick paper um, when getting it professionally printed and that makes your material stand out as well. And I think a lot of people sometimes think uh, professional printing can be uh, expensive, but actually it's also really inexpensive. Uh, I would suggest you check out Vistaprint. They, also, they usually have some good deals um, and then you can always go to your local print shop and even Costco, um, they have some great prices to, to check out. Um, and then when you utilize tech for your material creation, we will provide you with a professional print file that has special markings so that you can just send it to the print shop and they will be able to print it um, without needing, you don't need to send them the office print file, you'll send them the professional print file and then they can print it out for you. So consumer testing. Um, so once you've created your educational materials, uh, you will need to consumer test them before you start using them out in the field. So testing information with the audience before it's released and asking for feedback um, are the best ways for us to know if we're communicating clearly. Uh, we need to test and ask for feedback every time information is released to the general public. Uh, this will ensure that our materials um, we designed Will have the most impact in your community. Uh, very important, guys. Um, you want to make sure that you consumer test um, with your end users. So not the people, um, so with your end users, the people who you're handing it out to, who you're giving this material to, and not professionals in our line of work. I know sometimes it's really easy to ask um, another project to look at your material and tell you what you think, but um, you really get a good sense of if you're communicating clearly when you give it to 
you know, your community, you'll find out if everything is making sense as opposed to giving it to professionals in our line of work. We are in tobacco control and we're in this world all the time. So for us, it may make sense. But then when you go give it to your um, audience, they may not really understand. So you always want a consumer test with your end users. Um, and then tech also has this resource um, that you're seeing on the left-hand side. Um, it's a how-to guide uh, for consumer testing. Um, it's on our website if you want to check it out um, and get more information about consumer testing. Uh, there's, there's examples of, of what questions to ask uh, when you're doing this consumer testing. So if you want more information about that, um, go ahead and, and check that out on our website. Um, additional resources. So um, you may want to check these resources out too before developing your educational materials. Uh, Tech has a developing effective message guide. Um, it's available to download and print, but we have also created uh, short three minute video tutorials. They're called Tech Flicks on our website. Um, and they cover defining your audience again, developing your message, writing text that's easy to read, and how to frame your messages to promote equity. And then the CDC has um, these three next resources that you're seeing are from the CDC. So the Health Communication Playbook uh, has great information for when you're creating uh, your fact sheets. It even has like a checklist to make sure you have included all the information necessary to create a great fact sheet. So I think it's a pretty great resource. You can just make sure, did I include my contact information? Did I include a call to action? It has those little a list you can check mark that off. And then there's also um, this other resource uh, from the CDC called Everyday Words for Public Health Communication. Um, this is essentially a dictionary of some of those technical and medical terms that we use and the plain language version for those words. So the words that you want to use for your audience to understand mostly. Um, I thought that was a really neat resource. I had never seen it. So um, check it out if you're ever curious about how can I say this medical term in a plain language. Um, and then lastly, the CDC has uh, a guide uh, to clear writing. And this goes over how to make sure readers can understand your main message and any action steps you're asking them to take. Um, so you'll receive an email with these resources um, as well as a survey for you to give us feedback on this webinar. And these are like hyperlinks, so you can just click on them and you can download the resource. And lastly, you guys are hearing some exciting news first. We haven't posted this yet on Partners, but uh, Tech is excited to be hosting four listening sessions uh, the first week of May called Let's Get Tech Nickel, which I really love that name. Um, I think it's really clever. Um, so there will be two sessions to choose from uh, for material development and then two sessions for social media. And they're both on May uh, 5th and 7th. So please join us and share your ideas and insights. We want to hear from you. We want to know what's working, what's not, um, what resources and tips you have to share, and then your stories on material development and um, running social media campaigns. So look out for the registration links for these. They will be posted on partners. And then as well as in the email here, they're hyperlinked too. So you can just go on here and click on whatever session. Um, we're really excited to be hosting this. So. It'll be, well, we hope to have a lot of people joining us. Um, if for some reason your question doesn't get answered today or you think later on as you start developing your educational materials, um, oh, I have a question for them. Well, join us on the 5th or the 7th and, and we can answer some of those questions for you. So if you would like any technical assistance with your educational materials, please email me um, at ta at tech.org. Um, I have two emails, but this is one I will answer to. I, we can get all our requests in from here. So at ta, .tech, or ta at tech.org. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. So now I will be taking those questions. So Wendy, um, hopefully you can join me too. So let me go to the chat box here. So if you have any questions right now, go ahead and, um, and put them in. So I have, does 
Microsoft Word gave you a suggestion on how to lower the reading level for Flesh Kincaid if it's too high. Um, I don't know if they give you a suggestion uh, per se, but you want to use one to two syllable words and that will also lower your reading level. Um, and then I don't know, Wendy, if you have any other suggestions to, to how to lower those reading levels. Yeah. So the main thing that, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. The main thing that the Flesh Kincaid um, and other types of literacy testing um, methods use is the length of the words that you're using as well as the length of the sentences. So many times people will try and, and create a sentence with a lot of like, not necessarily a run on sentence, but like they want to add, you know, comma and add this information, comma, add this information. If you actually break those up into shorter sentences, that will tend to lower the reading level. Yeah. Um, I have but the other thing to keep in mind, <laughs> sorry, the other thing is that when you're testing the reading level, it's only going to test um, sentences that have a, a, a punctuation at the end. So if you have, let's say you have a, a list of bullet points and you don't have a period at the end of those bullet points, then it's not going to factor those into the, into the formula. So you'll want to um, make sure you add punctuation and then you can take it out at, you know, afterwards. But if you want that sentence to be factored in, then it needs to have punctuation at the end. Yeah. And I was just going to add, um, we have a text flex video that goes a little bit more in depth where it shows you what Wendy's talking about. Um, so check that out too, because it, it shows you like how you need to have your document laid out for it to read, hit your correct reading level. The, what I showed you was just a quick little version of it, but check it out. It's a uh, text flicks on our website. Um, and then there was a question about what about infographics? We use those quite a bit. So yeah, so infographics are a great way to show your, your data too, instead of having just bullet points of data, we Tech usually does create an infographic, a, a visual of your data. We'll use like a graph or a chart. So those are also a great way to reduce the amount of text that's in your material. And then we have, uh, can tech provide us uh, with mock-ups for consumer testing before we do a big amount of printing uh, mock-ups? Um, so Wendy, do you want to answer that? Um, I don't really know what that means. Maybe yeah. If someone could provide a little more clarification. Yeah. Um, but like I said, on that resource that we have, it has questions or the questions that you can ask um, your consumers too. So check that out. I might answer your question there. And then we have, let's see. Oh, um, Yes, uh, somebody asked for additional, res additional resources. Can you give us the link in the email? Um, yes, we will give you, oh, drafts. Okay, so yes, we will give you the, the links to the resources and then somebody responded with mockups means drafts. So can we give you drafts of um, consumer testing? So yeah, like I said, there's examples of questions you can pull out to, to create your consumer testing questions on, on that resource. Um, another question we're having is, do you have any tips, um, Wendy, on making materials ADA compliant? Do you have any? Yes. Yeah, so when um, our, all of our graphic designers are um, trained in making sure that um, materials are ADA compliant. Um, so I would say if you're concerned about that, reach out to us. Um, but in general, you want to make sure that your materials are using, are not using color to depict something. Um, so like it, if you want to have, if let's say you're trying to say yes is green and no is red, um, you don't want to just use the color to represent that because if someone's colorblind, they might not be able to see that. Um, there's different types of color blindness. And so our graphic designers have a program that they can actually run your material through to see if people with different types of color blindness will be able to see um, the different colors or like if there's enough contrast between. Um, the other thing, let me think, what else do we um, do? Oh, the other thing that we um, factor in is the size and style of fonts. 
So you typically don't want to use too many different types of fonts and you don't want to use fancy sort of script fonts. Um, and you want to make sure that your font size is um, at least 10 point, but that's pretty small. Um, so you want to make sure that your fonts are, um, you know, big enough for people to read. Uh, the other thing is, is that the way that you lay out the, the, the basically how you're, you're visually laying things out will also affect comprehension. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think that if that's a concern of yours, you should definitely reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody's asking, will these slides, um, in my presentation be available, like the video and my voice? Um, yeah, I think Wendy, we're going to be putting this probably recording on our website. We have a couple of other webinars that Wendy has done in the past and you can go back and listen to it. There's a tech support 101 um, one. So I believe we probably will be putting this on the website too with um, my audio. Yeah, if you go to the tech website, there's a tab that says CTCP funded, I think only or something. And you click on that and you'll find all of our technical assistance resources. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions? Is there any more? Um, let me go back into the chat. I don't know if I we've answered. I know Wendy. I saw you were answering some of them. So yeah. Um, this, there's one question. Do you have to register for the other webinars, or will we just use the same login code? Um, oh, are you talking about? Um, I believe this is the one for the let's get technical. Um, oh. It, you, you'll have to register for them. So when you click on the dates, um, you, there's a registration link too for it. And then there's a question, will there be Spanish content developed? So tech does have materials available in Spanish. Not all of the materials are available in Spanish. If you have a specific material that you've created that you would like translated into Spanish, you can send that to us. Um, reach out to ta at tech.org and um, we can get it translated for you. Oh, there's a question. Can you provide us with steps on readability statistics? Can you what? Provide us the steps on readability statistics. The steps. Well, I think you can, I mean, the, the, the easiest thing to do is to just Google the version of Word that you have and say uh, Flesh Kincaid reading level or readability testing and your Google search will actually come up with the exact instructions on how to do it. Does anybody else have any more questions? All right, I think um, then that is the end. I just wanna quickly, last slide, um, again, thank you all for joining us. And then um, here's my email again. If you wanna uh, have tech look at your educational material It'll help you develop it please reach out to us and thank you all for listening and i hope you all have the great rest of your day